Welcome to the future. Get ready to explore how spirituality and science will come together in the age of Aquarius. Hosted by JC Nova. Welcome to the future. I'm JC Nova, and today on the show, we're honored to talk with Robert M. Place, who's both a world renowned artist and author of several popular tarot decks, including the Tarot of the Sevenfold Mystery, the Buddha Tarot, the Angel's Tarot, the Alchemical Tarot, and more. We explore tarot history, symbolism, divination, and what to expect in the age of Aquarius. Enjoy the show. What first led you to illustrating and designing tarot? I first became aware of the tarot when I was in college because my girlfriend at that time, you know, she used to read the, read the tarot cards. Like she, of course, had the Wade Smith card deck, which was the about the only deck you could buy at that time. You know, since the late 1960s, I graduated in 1969. I got interested in, in the cards because because of the fascinating imagery, and I was I was always interested in that type of magical imagery. So I started looking through the library for books on magic, and I found images of these older French decks, like the Tarot of Marseille. Yeah, you know, I was really fascinated with it. I decided I was going to create my own tarot deck, and I'd copy the Tarot of Marseille cards. So I cut little pieces of cardboard the right size to the cards, and I painted the cards on on the little cardboard cutouts. I got about four cards done, and I realized this was a whole lot of work. And I was like, oh, my God, you know, there's 70 cards in the deck. How am I ever going to finish this? So I sort of lost interest in it. But then years later, when I was living in western New Jersey near the Delaware, I had a dream. You know, I wrote down the day, but I'll never, you know, I'll never forget the dream. It was like so lucid. I always paid attention to my dreams and, and dreams were a huge source of inspiration, which is why I was so enamored with surrealist and symbolist artists. I often tell people that my first form of divination is dream divination. So I had this dream. It was in 1982. See, this is when I was already selling jewelry and doing craft shows, right? And I, in the dream, it was really a whole other subject. I saw this woman who I knew was another jeweler from the craft shows, and she was walking down the street in the dream. So I followed her, and she walked into this brick building. So I followed her into the building, and she walked off in another room, and I was in the, the sort of the main, the, the foyer living room area. And there was a phone table on the side and with a, you know, one of those telephones with those black ones with the receiver on the top, you know, on the dial. And it rang. And when it rang, it, it, it was like, see, a lot of people don't realize this now because they have phones all over the place. But back in, back in the 1980s, when the phone rang, you used to pick it up, you know. So <laughs> you didn't have voicemail necessarily. You know, the phone would ring in the middle of the day and would interrupt you and you had to go run to pick, uh, pick up the phone and see who it was, right? So, so that's what was happening in the dream. The phone rang. And it was like, what? The phone's ringing in my dream? You know, like it's interrupting the dream. Like who's calling me? I didn't know you can interrupt somebody in the dream with a phone call. So I picked up the phone and it just woke me to this lucidity because it was sort of like really became alert when I, I thought like I'm being interrupted in my dream. So I picked up the phone and this operator got on and she said she had a person to person call for Robert Place from England. So I, I said, OK, I'm Robert Place. I'll take the call. She put on this uh, woman who was a secretary for a dream law firm. And she told me that I had an inheritance coming. And I said, I do. Where? Yeah. And she says, yeah, it's coming from an ancestor of yours in England and has lots of power. But but he misused it in certain ways. And there's a certain karmic debt attached to it. So if you're going to take the you know the inheritance, you're going to have to take on some of the debt and burn it off. You know, I didn't even think about it. I just said, oh, sure. OK. Because, <laughs> you know, that could be a little scary. So uh, it was so vivid, this dream, that when I woke up in the morning, I expected, you know, she, she told me that the inheritance would come in, like – in a box. I said, well, it's going to come in a box from England, right? And, and I said, so how do I know it? And she says, oh, you'll know it when you see it. It's called the key. All right. So I, when I woke up in the morning, I just like, boom, st- sat up in bed and I'm like looking for, for the bed expecting to see the box there. I mean, that's how vivid the dream was. And my wife's looking at me like, wow, what are you doing? And I told her about the dream. And she said, well, that's really exciting. Let's we'll see what happens. So now within like a couple, like maybe two days, I was sitting in the kitchen and my friend Scott, uh, who's a musician, Scott Jarrett, he came over and a friend of his had just sent him the Wade Smith cards as a present. And he wanted to show off his new deck to me, right? So he so he comes walking in. See, like, I'm, I'm like uh, sitting at the table and, and the, there's a back door to the kitchen to my uh, left. And of course, he's a good friend. So he just walked in the back door, right? And as he walks in, my head turned, like, just turned involuntarily. Like, 
I wasn't in, like consciously controlling my head. And, and my eyes zoomed in on the box in his hand. And then I realized, I recognized them from college, of course, as the tarot cards that my girlfriend used to use. And then I said, oh, and it, came, it was originally made in England. And the, the trumps are called keys. You know, the book was called The Key to the Tarot. And like, oh, yeah, that's it. The, key, the box with the keys from England, right? So I, so I realized that was, you know, and it's like the dream secretary had told me, it was like, you will know it when you see it. And I was like, oh, that's it. I see it. I know it. You know, <laughs> I mean, it was like her words came true. So he's showing me the cards, and then I told him about the dream, and I said, "Would well, you have to get a deck like this? That's what my dream's about." Okay, so now the next thing, I had this other f- friend Ed, who was an astrologer, is very intuitive, and he came. He came over the next day or so, and he gave, he gave me the Tarot of Marseille, and he said, "I have this Tarot," and there was this voice in my head just saying that you're supposed to have it. So he gave me the Tarot of Marseille. <laughs> So I had the Tarot of Marseille and I'm playing with it. But I said, but I still have to get the Wade Smith deck. And you, you see, like living in Western New Jersey at that time, you couldn't just go to the store and buy a deck because they weren't any. So I had to go into New York City, which wasn't that far away. You, you know, and, and I used to go to New York City anyway. I think I went to Times Square and I just went to a bookstore in Times Square and, and they had tarot decks in the counter there. And I just said, oh, I want one of these tarot decks. And the person behind the counter you mean the tarot? You know, like, you know, he's basically scolding me because I'm pronouncing it wrong. So I said, yeah, one of those taros, you know. So he he gave me the Wed Smith deck. They had some other, I think they had, they also had the Marseille deck and some other uh, European decks. But the thing is, I I went home. So I had the two decks. And I realized because, see, the the thing is, like, I always paid attention to my dreams. And I realized my, the dream maker, since then, I, basically the dream maker in classical mythology is Hermes, you know, the God, the messenger of the gods. And that's, he brings you dreams, right? I've identified him as Hermes since then, but my, the dream maker Hermes was telling me in the dream that I had this inheritance coming and has a really power. And, w- and really what the power was that it would give you, you know, just like I could pay attention to my dreams. Now I could make dreams happen with these cards. So it's sort of like giving yourself waking dreams. Of course, my girlfriend had used the Celtic cross spread back in college. So I immediately started doing that and I'm reading the books on Tarot. And of course I had always been interested in art and art history and I realized that the, most of the stuff that the tarot books were saying about the origin of the cards couldn't, didn't make any sense because they're saying it came from ancient Egypt or Fez Morocco or so. And it, none of this really, it just wasn't true, or, or, you know, according to art history. The style of the cards were obviously European. They were, you know, like they weren't Egyptian. What is the history? Like, what is the origins of tarot? So eventually, besides learning how to use the cards my own way and, you know, to use it like a waking dream. Like I basically, I learned to put the cards together in groups at least three, so they tell a story like a dream. You know, and then I started researching, trying to get books when people actually knew something about the history of cards, like Michael Dummett or uh, Gertrude Moakley, who were the you know pioneers in, in in tarot history. The tarot was first created in Renaissance Italy in the 1400s, which makes sense. All the imagery in the trumps can be related to other allegorical imagery created in the 1400s in Italy. And by comparing each card to the, the other images from Italy at that time, you can see what they mean. I mean, they're, they're basic allegorical images. So it's like some of them are, re- you know, are still prevalent in our culture, like justice with the scales. We can see her on top of every courthouse. But in the tarot, she doesn't have a blindfold. And you can see in the early images from, from the Renaissance, Justice didn't have a blindfold like, like she often has in the courthouse today. And you can see that was definitely, uh, that's the Renaissance image of Justice. So basically, cards themselves, when you're trying to find the origin of something, it's very hard because you have to, you have to define your terms. And then cards themselves are, are images made on paper. So the thing is, if you want to find out the history of cards, you have to go back to where paper comes from. And paper comes from China. It's hard to say exactly when paper was created in China, but China is the first place that paper was actually made. According to legend, it was made like in the first or second century AD. But the thing is, there's more evidence that it already existed BC. You know, so maybe by 200 BC they were already making paper. But basically, what paper is is that you're grinding up a plant material to cellulose and then making a pulp and then mixing it with water and spreading it on some kind of screen and letting it dry so that you have this substance. Usually they would use rag material or like a tradition of Chinese use mulberry bark combined with like rag, like cotton, linen, rag material. The Chinese made paper. They got to make the first things made out of paper. So if you think about things like one of the first uses of paper was wrapping paper, you know, like the wrap ceramics so they wouldn't break, right? Or they had made newspapers and then they made paper money and, and, they, and they learned how to print on paper because paper, see, printing and paper go together. Because paper really, you know, you can make a, a wood block and then you put ink on it and the paper absorbs it really easily. So now you can make prints and make 
and you don't have to hand paint everything. And so it makes reproduction easy. So that's how they were able to make paper money. Um, I think about the year 900, we can, we can say definitely the Chinese had invented playing cards. And they had three different kinds of playing cards. They had ones that were based on, they were basically used them for playing games. They used to play dominoes with different, you know, they make them out of wood or ivory or bone or something. Now they'd started substituting paper. So they had domino cards. Then they also had ones that were used for playing a, a game like chess. And then they had ones that were called the money deck, which had four suits that were based on money. So there was the, the suit of coins. There were suits of see the, the Chinese coins are round with a hole in the center. So the whole the, the hole in the center, so you could you could tie stacks of coins together to give people a lot of money. The first suit is coins. Then there were stacks of coins, and then there's many stacks of coins and myriads of stacks of coins. You know, so it's like money, a stack of money, a lot of money, a whole lot of money. And there were basically one to nine like pip cards, and then the, the, the interesting thing is in in the suit of like you know lots of money and more lots of money. Uh, they they didn't have pictures of the coins on it anymore, you know, because the coin card just has these circles with a little square hole. And then, you know, the stacks of coins look like sticks, basically. But then the other ones had pictures of people on it. The people in it were from this Chinese legend. I think it was like 108 thieves who stole from the rich to give to the poor, which I thought was really interesting because here's like the the suits with a lot of with a lot of money. They had this whole thing, this sort of Robin Hood like story. You know about about the, about giving the money to the poor, right? You know, and it was, it was really fascinating. So the more money you had, the more you had, the more the thieves giving out more money. It's called the water margin story, I think, something like that. And it's funny because you know I teach in China. I've been there so many times, and, I, and even now I teach on Zoom in China. And that's, and when I tell them, I say, "Well, this is a lot like you know this story." I'm congratulating on inventing cards, right? And I'm telling them, this story is a lot like Robin Hood. And they go, "Who's Robin Hood?" <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so that decks somehow spread through Asia to the Islamic countries where they started creating other decks. And the most important deck to us in, in our history here is the Mumluk deck. The, the Mumluks were the Islamic rulers in the Middle East and in, in Egypt and in, in Syria in that area. The Muslim Empire, of course, spread right out to Spain. So that deck was brought to Spain with the Islamic Empire. The Spanish then started, you know, they started seeing Islamic cards and they wanted to copy it. Now that deck had four suits, which were coins, cups, uh, scimitars, and polo sticks, which sound a lot like the minor suits in the throw, right? Okay, so, and, and they each had 10 pip cards, you know, an ace to 10, and then they had three royal cards, which are like the, the you know, the vizier, his lieutenant, and the second lieutenant. They're all male. Okay, so even today, now, if you go to Spain and Italy, you'll see that they made, you know, there's still decks they're making that are based on that Mumluk deck that's became the traditional Spanish and Italian decks, where the suits are coins, cups, swords, instead of scimitars. They didn't, didn't know what polo was, so they just made it into batons or sticks. And then and then there's three royal cards that are all male. There's a, the king, his, his knight, and the knave. Or, some, or sometimes it's the squire, the, the, you know, who assists the knight. So the point is, that you want to know where the tarot comes from. So what happened is, in Italy, you can see the standard deck looked like the minor suits in the tarot. But it's not a tarot, you know. We don't define it as a tarot until you add the trump cards, right? So in the in the early 1400s, by you know, sometime around the 1420s, they started playing games where they added an extra fifth suit with trump cards, which are the like they these are trick taking games, and the trumps were what the most powerful cards, you know, like it's sort of like in bridge where you make one of the suits a trump suit. Well, these are they were making decks that had a natural trump suit. Originally, it was called triumphi. And that's originally what the tarot was called in Italy, Carte di Triumphi, or Triumphi cards, which means they had a triumph, this, which is this, these cards that represented this triumphal parade. And they were the most powerful cards in the deck. So they're the ancestors of uh, uh, the game of bridge, saying so that we were playing games. But the, but the cards in the trump suits were very allegorical. And that's, where we, and that's why everybody got interested in the tarot, because of all those allegorical figures. And that's the basics, but I could expand on it, on and on and on. Do you believe like the tarot cards all have universal meaning? Did they, in, in historical times, did they use tarot to do readings for other others or to make predictions or were they used to tell stories? Yeah, all, all of that. <laughs> History is not neat and simple. <laughs> like I just gave you a very simple version. So, okay, in Italy... They took, you know, the standard playing card decks is the, is the same suit symbols that we have in the minor suits and throw, and then they added the trumps to it, right? Okay, but that's an, that's a simple answer that's not 
the actual truth is more complex because the oldest deck we have with trump cards added to it they didn't use the they didn't use the standard suit for the minor suits they created a whole new deck it was uh, marziano created this deck for the duke of milan and the suits were eagles phoenixes turtle doves and doves they had 10 pips but they didn't necessarily have uh three royals they had a queen and a king maybe as far as we can tell and then there were like 16 trump cards added to it they were all classical gods so they weren't even all, at all the allegory See, back when I first started, like a lot of books were saying, oh, the cards came from ancient Egypt and are acting like this whole set of trumps was developed in ancient Egypt and somehow passed on to Europe, you know. And this is based on occultist ideas from the 1700s, by according to Jebelon. But the thing is, that set of trumps evolved over the 1400s in Italy. It didn't start off that way. Like, because the oldest one we can find are this set of 16 gods, you see, it's classical gods. There were other decks where they were called imperatory cards, where they only had one trump, which was the emperor. So there's an evolution going on. And then, you know, like we can see how even when they get more to the familiar allegorical series, that it's not always exactly the same. The earliest decks, tarot decks that are still in existence are hand-painted decks that were created in Milan for the Dukes of Milan, like Maria uh, Visconti. And then his his daughter married uh, Sforza, who, who basically took over as the Duke. And then so we have so then we have the Visconti deck, we have the Visconti Sforza deck. One of the most early complete ones is the one that's in the Yale Library, which is called the Carrie Yale Visconti. And that has like, I think about it, I think it's like there's 11 trumps that still exist in it. The Visconti Sforza deck, which is created maybe like around 1450, it you know, has a fool and 19 trumps. It doesn't, none of, the, none of these decks, like we, and we have other fragmented decks from Milan, and none of them have a, a devil or a tower in them, but they have all the other trumps. And, but, they, but the Carrie Yale Visconti also has the Christian virtues, faith, hope, and charity. And, and, you know, so like they don't necessarily follow suit. And lately we've been finding more and more evidence that Florence was really influential in developing the, what we consider the standard tarot. But the thing is in Florence, they didn't call it the tarot. They called it the minchiati. See, in fact, well, they didn't, obviously they didn't call it the tarot anywhere. At first they called it triumphi. <laughs> so if they were calling it triumphi, and then by the time we get to, to the end of the 1400s, they're calling it tarot. And nobody's really sure why they started calling it Tarot, but it seems like that Triumphy got to be an ambiguous term because the Triumphy was a game where you used the Trumps. And there started to be these other games where they would just use four suit decks and assign them as Trumps like you do in playing bridge today. So they got to be an ambiguous term. So they needed another term for the deck with the natural Trump suit. So they started calling it Tarot. But in Florence, they called it Menchiati, which basically means a foolish thing because it had fool in it. <laughs> They eventually, in Milan, they developed the 78-card tarot deck, right, where you have 20, you know, you have the fool and 21 trumps, and you, and then the, the, the uh, four minor suits. By the 1500s, they started, they expanded, in, in Florence, where they basically originated this order, it seems, they expanded it to 40 trumps, and they, and so the Minchiati today has 40 trumps and a fool, because <laughs> they added all the signs of the zodiac, they added the four elements, they added the Christian virtues, you know, they added all these cards, so, because it's a weird thing, because like, see, a lot of occultists were saying, oh, well, you know, the, the, when you look at the Trumps, these are really uh, supposed to be the, the astrological signs, and they're connected to the Kabbalah, to, uh, to the four elements and the, and the planets and, and astrological signs, because they couldn't do that, because that was magic, they'd be burned at the stake for doing it, right? Okay, but that wasn't true, because, <laughs> okay, because the, the Minkiati added all this, you know, if they wanted to make the signs of the Zodiac, they would just make the signs of the Zodiac. Astrology was something practiced by popes. I mean, it wasn't like it was black magic. You know, this is state-of-the-art stuff in the 1400s. Like priests were astrologers. You know, it wasn't like you had to hide astrology. So it didn't make any sense. More often what people were upset about is having the pope cards in the deck, because then as the deck spread to northern Europe, they stopped, more and more they, got, they wanted to get rid of the pope and the papists, because that was, that was the thing that was troubling the people, because they didn't, you know, the, the pro, you know, once we get into 1500s, then we have the Protestant Reformation. I started reading tarot when I was eight. My mom taught me how to do tarot and astrology. And when I have used the decks, I use the deck more for like for intuitive like I look at the images and it inspires me or I might, if I'm doing a reading for somebody, it will start telling me a story. And I'm just curious, do you see tarot as like a spiritual tool? And when someone's doing a reading, do you feel like the images have an effect on your consciousness when you're doing readings for yourself or for others? Yeah, basically what you're saying is what I do. 
you know, that, I mean, and it's sort of like what my my dream was about. It's sort of like you're giving yourself a waking dream. So you're letting the images affect you and interpret them. And you, basically the simplest idea about divination is that you're using the pictures to create a story and then you put the, you put them together and you tell the story and somehow the story has meaning to you. It just works. So it's just like how, you know, a dream has meaning, you know, because a lot of people think, oh, well, dreams are just nonsense and, you know, they don't pay attention to their dreams. But then, you know, modern psychology is based on interpreting your dreams and that they're, they're meaningful and they, and they have therapeutic value. But like if you study Jungian psychology, say so telling you that your dreams are actually leading you deeper and deeper into the unconscious and that the unconscious has, has a purpose. And it's like your dreams, the dreams are pushing you towards what he calls individuation. Individuation is, of course, it's a totality of your spirit, your psyche, that uh, we would might call enlightenment, you know, if we weren't psychologists. But when I teach, you know, I teach people how to do tarot. Basically, what I, like I spend a lot of time talking about history and the, and the images. I want them to understand the images because too often we look at the images and we don't understand where they came from and what their history is. We apply things to them that don't make sense. So I want some people to understand those images and, and identify with them. You know, it's like, like, you know, like if you met somebody and you want to make friends, you, you start talking to them about their life and about what they, and you want to know more about their past, right? Or where they grew up. Like, that's where you started with me, right? <laughs> like, how did I become an artist? Where did I grow up, right? Okay. So that's what we were doing with the Tarot, too. It's like, how, well, how did the Tarot happen? Well, you know, you know, more books now have real history of the Tarot cards. It's gotten to be accepted. When I first started doing, people used to be mad at me for saying these things, you know, they go, no, that's not where it comes from. But I remember I did an interview on the radio back in the 90s, and uh, this the woman was telling me, oh, well, you know, no, the cards come from Egypt, and it's made by, and the Egyptians were black, and it's made by black people. And how dare you say that? It came from Italy. Yeah, a lot of people lose the history, and the history is so important to to kind of help give you insight to where it came from and and what the, the tarot decks mean. And as far as like doing readings. So if someone's starting out to read tarot, like when you're teaching class, what do you, what do you recommend to your students? Like, do you suggest, you know, whatever deck speaks to you, or do you recommend a certain deck that they start with and what type of rituals they should be practicing while they're learning how to read? You know, I'm a deck designer, right? So of course I recommend my decks. I started with the Waysmith Tarot. So I usually uh, include the Waysmith Tarot in my discussions, like when I was, you know, I've been teaching for years at the New York Open Center, you know, before the pandemic, they used to, we used to have in-person classes. And of course they say, okay, we can use the Wade Smith deck or one of my decks, you know. The meanings on my cards aren't necessarily the same as the Wade Smith cards because I've applied my own meanings. I'm referring to the Wade Smith deck, but then not always agreeing. So, so you have to look at the cards in front of you. Like you're saying, like you look at the pictures and you have to like uh, interpret the pictures that are, are there, right? Although the cards were created in Italy in the 1400s, this is a time when they were reviving the mystical philosophies of the classical world, because that's what's, what's called the Renaissance, like it's rebirth, right? And we, usually they think, oh, we, well, what's being reborn is classical art and, and, and then the scientific attitude. But at first, they're more interested in the more mystical ideas of the classical world, which is like Hermeticism, which does come from Egypt. So the thing is, Hermetic philosophy the philosophy of, of Roman Egypt and, and Ptolemaic Egypt, that influenced the imagery in the Renaissance generally. So there is an Egyptian influence in the Tarot. It doesn't mean it came from Egypt, but that's like our Western philosophical mystical heritage that's being expressed in those cards. Because, see, in the Renaissance, like, you know, people say, oh, it was only a game, but the thing is, in the Renaissance, there's no separation between high art and low art, and there's no separate, like a game could be something worthwhile. In fact, even in uh, the Marziano deck, which was made for the Duke of Milan, Marziano, when he, he puts this question to the, to the Duke, he says, well, is it, you know, is it worth the Duke's time to play a trivial game? And he, said, and he says, well, and then he answers, right? well, of course it is if it has philosophical importance, you know, and my deck does. You know? So like, so then he goes in the great philosophy about what, you know, what all the different suits mean and how, uh, and the different gods and what they represent and how that, it's not like games are trivial. Games are something artistic and important. And it's not like uh, because it's made in Italy, it has nothing to do with Egypt because, and, and it, of course the, the Egypt we're talking about isn't, so much ancient Egypt as classical Egypt in the classical world, right? These things are too departmentalized in our modern thinking. Once Rome had taken over Egypt, the cult of Isis spread all through Rome. So there were temples to Isis in England. You know, it wasn't like Egypt was in Egypt. You know, <laughs> the Egyptian religion was everywhere. That was a contender with Christianity. So, so in a way, uh, we could have been worshiping Isis instead of Jesus. It just was a, 
you know, like uh, just a matter of who won out, you know. What is one of the latest tarot projects that you're working on, or are you working on any new decks or doing any uh, new illustrations? Oh yeah, oh I'm always my main deck is the alchemical tarot. You know, the way I got involved with that has a lot to do with the whole idea of the age of Aquarius. So we'll save that for a little later. The interesting thing is because remember my first dream was like I got a, a phone call from England. Once I did the started doing the alchemical tarot, I got a phone call from England from uh, uh, Harper Collins uh, in England, which is the branch is called Thorson's. And they said they wanted to publish, the, publish it. So I actually got a phone call from England, just like in the dream. And then that ended up being the Alchemical Tarot when it was published by Thorson's. And then when it went out of print, I got the rights back and then I made different editions. So the last edition I made was the fifth edition and, and that's just sold out. So I so in the meantime, I was designing a sixth edition where I changed the color and the symbolism a little bit. And, uh, and so that's being printed right now. I, in my printers are in China. The deck should be here by uh, sometime in, in January. So that's the, that's the newest project. And But also in the meantime, I've been working on, uh, like remember how I was talking about Corda Jevalon and how he's the first occultist to write about the Tarot in his book, Moon Primitive, which came out. And like, well, it was, a, it was a, an encyclopedia. It came in many volumes, but the volume, uh, the eighth volume came out in, in 1781. And that's where he talked about the Tarot. And then, he had, so he had this essay on the Tarot and, he's, and where he says that it came from ancient Egypt, but then, you know, he's, he's exploring the cards and seeing these connections uh, to the, this sort of archetypal connection between the Trumps and, and Egyptian themes, which aren't, it's not exactly wrong. And it, it's not like he's saying, oh, this is the definitive answer that it came from Egypt. He's sort of speculating, right? And and, and the show he's speculating, he put another essay by the by his friend, the Comte de Malay, where he also thought there was an Egyptian theme in the Torah, but he doesn't exactly agree with everything Corda Giblon said. So you see, it's not like he's putting it forth like a theory. And he says, oh, here's my theory and here's my friend's theory. And they're not exactly the same. But the cultists have that all act like, oh, this is carved in stone. You know, obviously, this is all, you know, I know the true answer. And, you know, you know, they're, and they're a bunch of con artists, basically. So <laughs> the thing is, the Comte de Malay's essay was, is really interesting to me because it was more complete than Giblon's. In Decker's book on, on the Torah, they, they basically speculate that uh, the Comte de Malay's uh, essay was written first and influenced Carter Giblon. And, and it goes, because he, he has this more coherent theory about about the Trumps, like he th- he thinks about them as he he reads them backwards from the world to the fool, and looks at them as they they illustrate the different ages of man, from the age of gold to the age of silver to the Iron Age. So man is becoming more and more fallen, and then we get to the fool, which is like the madman, which is basically basically we start with the world, which is Isis creating creating the, this beautiful golden age world, and we end up with the magician who's like a, a, a con artist, and 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 then the fool is a madman, and and that's where we are now. So the thing is, by going backwards like that through the cards, what he's saying is that if you went forward through the cards from where we are now back towards the ices in the world, you're, you're moving up to greater and greater spiritual purity and more enlightened state, which is exactly what I see in the cards, which is the hermetic message that's in the cards. He's just looking at it from the opposite angle, but it's very accurate what he's saying. And yet, and yet and most writers just ignore him. You know, <laughs> and this is the, this is actually, and then he goes on to talk about divination with the minor suits, and he's trying to work out divination with the minor suits and like uh, comparing it, trying to learn from different decks like the Alatet deck, which is this French playing card deck that used Spanish suit symbols, but then they have sort of like imagery with with some of the pips. And it, he didn't use the Marseille deck that he was referring to; he was using the Bensonchon, which is a, a French deck that's like something like the Marseille deck, but it was cr- created in. Uh, Eastern uh, France, and it influenced decks in, in Switzerland and Germany. And in, in that deck, there's no Pope and Papist. There's uh, like uh, Jupiter and Juno, the, the classic gods that replaced the Pope and the Papist. And then there's other things about it that like, obviously, when you're looking at his descriptions, he's obviously describing that deck. Like, a, like I talk about the devil has a minion who's clawing his, th- his thigh. Well, that's only seen in that deck. Or he talks about how the charioteer is holding a spear, which is only seen in that deck, you know, not in the Marseille deck. And the pip cards in that deck, interestingly, on the four of coins, there's Fortuna in the center, like, you know, like standing on, the, on our globe. And then you see, right, sure enough, when he talks about the four of coins, and of course, this is um, dedicated to Fortuna and represents prosperity. And, you know, so you can see he's picking up on this imagery. And because and like in a lot of a lot of tarot books, they'll talk about how. You know, when Pamela Cohen Smith designed the Wade Smith deck and then she put all this imagery on the pip cards, that was such an innovation and hadn't happened before. But that's not true. You see, because when we, you know, because there's very little imagery in the Marseille deck, but then we see other decks that were like other playing card decks 
have more imagery on on the pip cards, especially in German decks. And then and you can see even this the Ben Sanchon or this uh, Alatet deck. There's a lot of imagery that then he's interpreting symbolically uh, for divination, which is like what you know you're looking at the pictures and interpreting them, right? I mean that's really what what it's based on. Now here's the essential thing. Like you were asking about divination before. Okay, so when when cards were first introduced in Spain, the Mamluk decks, they had they had calligraphy on them. On the royal cards, they don't actually show pictures of the vizier and his and his lieutenants. They they just have have the name written in calligraphy, and then they have you know they look like Persian rug designs, like all the stylized swirling, and, and the suit symbol, right? But there's other calligraphy on other cards, which of course I didn't know what it said. And then recently, more recently, you know, I've been able to find translations. Other scholars have looked into it, and there's all these poems on the cards that seem to be related to divination. So the cards were used for playing a card game, but they also could be used for divination from the beginning before they were even European. Okay, now, so when we look at early cards that are used for divination, most often we know for sure because they have the meanings written right on the cards. In fact, there's uh, Botea's deck, which was the first tarot deck like this, was created in the 1400s, and it has it has these three-line poems written right on the cards. You know, And, of course, the suits aren't, again, the suits aren't the standard uh, tarot suits. They're, they're uh, eyes and whips and cups and arrows. So, you know... Like again, they play, everybody. This is the Renaissance. The, you know, it's the most creative period in European history. So you can't. People weren't held down to something. I mean, then they started creating decks of cards with more suits. Like when it, when it came to Germany and other places, like you get there's decks of cards with twelve suits. You know, <laughs> they weren't like becoming they didn't become standard. But they but their people experimented with all different things. But anyway, playing cards themselves, the regular playing cards were used for divination more often than the tarot. We don't have as much evidence of the tarot being used for divination as just the playing cards. And and then see then there were these books like they were called lot books where or divination books where you know there are different ones like the ones made in Germany where uh, there would be a wheel you would spin and have different animals on it and then when and it would point to an animal then you look through the book for the picture of that animal and have the you know you'd have the meaning you wanted right okay so eventually started doing it with playing cards instead you know where you, where you could cut playing cards and get a playing card to find the meaning in the book or they have a spinner with the playing card on the spinner. Which card do you think in the tarot deck relates to best relates to the age of Aquarius? That's a good question. Okay, maybe the Empress or the World. The World wouldn't be bad. The World is the is, isn't just the World, but it's the mystical experience of the World. See, like the, understand the World. The name of the World should be Soul of the World or Anima Mundi. You know, instead of Mundi, it should be Anima Mundi because what what it's showing. It's it's based on an ancient mandala like design called the quincunx, where the the thing is there's four things in the corners that represent the fourfold physical world, the four elements, the four directions, the four seasons, the four evangelist symbols. These are all interconnected in medieval symbolism. And the reason they're in the corners is therefore they illuminate what's in the center, which is called the sacred center or the quinta essentia, like an alchemy. That's called the, the quinta essentia, the essential fifth element, which is the spirit that animates the 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 four elements and the spirits made out of pure anima mundi the soul of the world which is usually shown as a beautiful woman so that's why there's a woman in the center of, uh, of the mandala and she and she represents so she doesn't represent the world but the world is in, ensouled so if you think of the age of Aquarius as when there's going to be this in, you know a more spiritual world then that would be a good card you know because it shows the world transformed We were talking earlier about when do you think the age of Aquarius first started? Everybody has a different opinion on age of Aquarius when it first began. Back in 1987, I kept hearing on the radio that the harmonic convergence was coming. It was a big deal, you know, and and, and it was supposed to be the lining of the planets. It was going to uh, and this was going to be the uh, the start astrologically. It was going to set off the age of Aquarius. So the age of Aquarius was beginning. And and I and I said, yeah, right, okay. Another more more new age nonsense, you know. Like I wasn't paying attention to it. But at this time, you know, I was living in New Jersey. I was making jewelry, and I, and I and I had this dream, you know, about the tarot. And I got more and more involved in the tarot, and I started seeing all these things and reading all these books because because the, the tarot books I read didn't make any sense. So I started reading more and more books on Gnosticism and and alchemy and all these subjects. I had have this book uh, called the. the uh, Picture Museum of Sorcery, Magic, and Alchemy, which is an old French a reprint of an old French book that had all these pictures of old tarot cards and alchemical images and stuff. People getting worried about me because I was spending all this time making these charts, and I wasn't even a writer yet. I was mostly an artist, right? And I'm not. I'm, my jewelry business is falling apart. After the dream, 
remember I told you about the karmic debt? Well, my jewelry business started falling apart. I think that was the karmic debt, right? So the, and then I, I, and I was so focused on this. And, you know, like my jewelry store has got stacks of books up to the ceiling that I'm reading instead of doing my work. You know, people go, what's wrong with you? You know, like you, you seem obsessed. So uh, one day I'm sitting there listening to the radio and the commentator on the radio uh, was saying like, well, during this, this new age and the, uh, the uh, harmonic convergence, there's a new awakening coming and people who are really sensitive. There's going to be a flood of uh, spiritual information coming to them. They'll be get this t- terrible hunger for spiritual information. And I was like, wow, that's what's happening to me. You know, so it's like, well, it explained what was going on. So then I started to pay attention because it was my experience. One day I was reading the Picture Museum of Sorcery, Magic, and Alchemy. I was looking at this mandala that represents the Philosopher's Stone, like an alchemy. And see, like an alchemy, like the great work of alchemy, the magnum opus, is the, is, is the, the idea is to create this stone that's not a stone. It's the stone that's not a stone. It's not material. It's basically what the alchemical process is you're taking a substance, the prima materia, and you're taking it and you're putting it through these chemical processes, which would kill it and, re- and revive it. And then you're, and then the soul that was hidden on the inside is now exposed on the outside. And that's the uh, philosopher's stone is pure soul. And it becomes this magical catalyst that's supposed to be, a, you know, and, and see the thing is alchemists believe that all metals were connected, like lead was just impure gold. You know, and so as you purified base metals like lead, you know, it, it become iron and tin and all these other metals until it becomes gold. And that was just the purest metal. So and as the philosopher could transform himself into his highest state. So it could transform lead into gold. But the idea is it could transform anything into its highest state. So it would transform the alchemists themselves into a more of an enlightened sage and it would heal any in- illness and could supposedly prolong life indefinitely, which really was more the goal. Because like everybody like focuses on lead to gold. But the but the point was the more important thing to most alchemists was like, how do you heal illness? How do you prolong life? So they can't really show the Philosopher's Stone as, because it doesn't, you can't see it. <laughs> so how do you show it? So you would show it symbolically. So they make this mandala. So in this, this book, there's this image where it shows this heart with a rose coming out of it in the center of a, a wreath of thorns. And then it's in the middle of a cross. And then in the, uh, the spaces that the cross creates, there's the symbols of the four elements in the four corners. And it's a quincunx symbol that I learned about later. And I'm thinking about it. And I said, well, you know, obviously it's, it's sort of like the, you know, and there were drops of blood coming off the heart. So it sort of looked like the, the sacred heart image in Christianity, but there was this rose coming out and the, and the four elements. But I was thinking about, well, you know, in Christianity, the, the four evangelist symbols were related they did relate to the four elements in the fourfold world, right? Like in alchemy. And I'm thinking about how the heart is a symbol of the soul. And then I was thinking about this Egyptian symbol for the soul, which looks like this dancing woman with one leg up. And she looks a lot like the dancing figure on the world card in the tarot. And then it dawned on me, I said, wait a minute, the, the world card in tarot has the four evangelists, which are the four elements. And she's in a wreath standing in the center, just like this, like the philosopher's stone. So I'm saying, well, see, there's a correlation here between the philosopher's stone and the world card in the tarot. They're really uh, locked symbols, you know? like the, the spiritual revelation. So uh, I said, well, so therefore it seems that if the final card in the trumps illustrates the final outcome of the great work, then all the cards in the trumps could be, be illustrating the opus. And when I said that, it was like, whoosh, it just unlocked this portal in my mind. And then all these, this flood of imagery came out like, like a spontaneous revelation. And I just saw all the tarot images and the alchemical images I had been studying all just linked together. And I took my my book out on psychology and alchemy by Jung, and it has all these pictures, alchemical pictures. So I'm going through the book and I'm writing down notes next to all the pictures, which tarot cards they are. And then, and then, I, so that got really nuts. So then, like, I started making charts and doing all those things. And then I started, you know, basically, a friend of mine said, my friend Kathy said, "Well, you're an artist. Start start doing this deck." <laughs> so I said, "Okay." So I started doing, you know, so I started spending more time doing these these cards. And then it's these synchronistic events started happening. It was like the deck wanted to happen. So I couldn't st- see, uh, you know, remember, like I told you in college, I sort of lost interest after four cards because it's so much work. Well, this is like I was so driven, you know, like crazy driven that I couldn't stop making the deck, you know. So I, so I was making more and more of the cards and, this, you know, d- drawing drawing the pictures in, in pen and ink. One day I was in a health food store in New York City. I was on the checkout line and there was these all these magazines and there's a magazine called Gnosis. And of course, I had been reading about Gnostics and alchemists and all these people, right? And and, and I go, well, Gnosis. I mean, Gnostics have their own magazine. This is weird, you know. So I'm looking at it a little bit, and then my friend Sue said, "Well, aren't you going to buy that? You know, <laughs> like that's your thing. Buy it, you know." 
like people kept nudging, like just like Kathy. And, you know, I, I sort of needed friends to nudge me in the right direction a lot. I bought the magazine. I came home and I read it cover to cover. I really liked it. So I said, and then, and this voice in the back of my mind, which of course I identify as Hermes, said, they're going to do an issue on the tarot. Send them your pictures, uh, your tarot pictures, because then it'll be in the magazine for their tarot issue. I got the editor's address. I, I sent I sent them copies of uh, a couple of cards I was working on. Like the like the first card I had done was the star card with the, the siren of the philosophers, right? And it looks like a mermaid. She sort of looks, sort of looks like the Starbucks symbol. The star is a good uh, symbol as well for Age of Aquarius, I think. Yeah, it makes, sort of makes sense, doesn't it? Okay, well, yeah. anyway, the thing is, she looks like the Starbucks symbol, but she's holding her breast, and, and there's these streams coming out of her breast. And one is milk and one is blood, and the red and white are the opposites in alchemy. It's like masculine and feminine. That's the first drawing I did. So I, I sent that and some, some other drawings. I sent it off to, uh, you know, the, the Xerox them, basically, and sent them off to uh, the editor at Gnosis, uh, Jay Kenny. And he, a week later, he calls me up, and he goes, I'm not doing an issue on the Tarot. Why do you think I'm doing an issue on the Tarot? And I said, I don't know, some voice in my head told me that. He says, well, I'm doing this issue on, on the goddess, and this came in just right. I want this, this is, you know, I'm doing this article on the Sophia, and this is a perfect illustration to go with it. I'm going to put it in the magazine, and I want you to write a one-page article to go with it, you know, like go under the picture about this deck you're working on. So, see, and I said, oh, because that's just like Hermes. See, he lied to me to get me to do the right thing. Yeah. <laughs> so Hermes has been directing you. <laughs> yes, because see, if he had told me that, Oh, you just send it. This will come in at the right time for the illustration for that. It's like, come on, that's too far fetched. Says, but the idea that they would do an issue on the tarot, and I'm doing tarot cards, made more sense. So he told me the thing that made more sense to get me to do it to motivate me. And then, of course, it it all worked out exactly the right time, and everything worked. Okay, so I so I did that, and then Rosemary Ellen Guiley, who was a, another New Age author who written lots of books, right? She she saw the article, and then she was writing a book on the tarot. So she got in touch with me, and she said. Um, I really want you to write something about uh, this. I'm writing a book on the mystical tarot and I want to include some of your cards in here. So I, I put, I put, you know, two cards uh, in, I forgot what it was, the devil and another card. And then, and I wrote, you know, a longer article for her book on that. Right. And then, so that was that. So that was the second. So I've already been, I never was a writer before and I've already been published twice. Right. You know, cause basically I'm an artist. So now, Although people always told me that I that I, I'm very eloquent in how I speak and I should be a writer, even when I was in college. But I always the, I'm a little dyslexic and I always had trouble spelling and stuff. So it sort of like you know, stopped me from wanting to be a writer. But the, what I with this motivation now I overcame that. So I, you know I applied myself and started writing. So then later she she was doing a book on alchemy. And then she hired me as a ghostwriter to write parts of the book because I knew more because I did so much research and knew more about it. So then I was published now as a, uh, in her book as again, you know, even though I didn't get credit on the cover, but you know she thanks me in the credits. And then finally she said, "Look, well, how are you coming with the alchemical tarot?" And I said, "Well, I'm supposed to be making jewelry <laughs> to make money, and it's like uh, so she's cutting into my business, and so I can't spend that much time." And I says, "Well, you know, you have to get a contract and you get an advance from the publisher, and then they give you money so you free up your time." And I'm like, well, that's a good idea. And she says, look, I really would like to work with you on this because, you know, I, like I know how to do this. And so, you know, let's team up. So she showed me how to write a proposal. One of her publishers was Thorson's in, in England. So we presented to Thorson's. And then now, you know, I was an unknown, but it, we had all this artwork, right? That, you know, I had maybe like 14 cards done by this time. So I showed them the Xeroxes of the artwork. And then, and then we wrote this really good proposal. And I had Rosemary, who's like, you know, acknowledged new age author with me. So they felt safe with me. They said, okay, sure. And then that's why they called me from England, gave me the contract and they gave me a year to finish it, which of course I, I it took me much longer to do. And then, so it th- basically it took two years and they gave me this extension, which I heard of, see, this stuff is like, HarperCollins was the biggest publisher in the world. I had this contract. I got an advance they, they bent over backwards, gave me an extra year to make it, which they don't do for new authors. They would have just demanded their money back or something. And they did all this unheard of things. And I thought this was like normal. I didn't know. And like, you know, I'd be telling my friend, like my friend Scott, you know, who brought over the cards that time. He, he you know, he was always trying to get things, stuff published and never get anything published. And then, and then I said, oh, yeah, I, I'm writing a book. I said, really? Yeah. And with Harper Collins, you know, was, really? You know, like, but you're not a writer, you know. <laughs> No, no, I'm a writer now. Yeah, and like it's people. Really, so uh, you know, it's like sort of. I didn't realize how unusual it was. It was like the tarot wanted to be published, and and so it, that came anyway. It came out in 1994, 
the really interesting thing is that at the same time, there was this huge angel craze. I think that was part of the whole new new age thing too. Again, like the age of a curse, because like everybody was into angels, and they just like it was so crazy. <laughs> so Rosemary was writing books on angels, and and there's pictures of angels everywhere. But if you like, if you went to a mall, there were pictures of angels selling shoes in the shoe store. You know, it was like it wasn't just a new age thing anymore. It was like every, you know, there was like Calvin, Calvin and Hobbes in cartoons were talking about what is this thing with angels all over, you know, <laughs> Harper, uh, Collins, San Francisco wanted, uh, they, they approached Rosemary to team up again to do, to do a deck about angels. Now, see, ba- basically what we teamed up is I did all the artwork with the uh, chemical throw. I wrote the, I wrote the whole book basically. And she just helped me frame it, you know? So, but I needed her because I, I was, uh, you know, I was learning how to write a book. So she's basically teaching me how to put it together. So, but this time I just did the artwork and she wrote the book based on what I, based on my ex- verbal descriptions of each of the cards. We had to do that so fast because they wanted to catch the angel craze that it was like, it was just horrible. Like basically I had to, to meet the contract. I had to get up in the morning, start drawing until like one o'clock in the morning and go to bed and get up in the morning and draw again all day long. And, you know, and just, you know, basically stop to go to the bathroom and eat things and, you know, wash up quickly. And, and like people, you know, people would call me and Roseanne would say, no, you can't talk because he's doing, he's got to work on this project. He has no time to talk to anybody. So I said, well, when can he talk? I said, well, call him next month. You know, I handed it in like, you know, about five days ahead of uh, deadline. And, and, and they were really strict. Like if I didn't hand them by deadline, they wanted the money back, you know? So that came out the same year. So then, then basically it was like a glut of tarot decks on the market. And, and I think what happened is like, they started, publishers thought like, oh, this is a new age thing. We better get in on this. And they, and they almost thought like the worst artwork you could have on the tarot deck, the better somehow that made it more, more magical or something. And of course that didn't work out very well because printing prices went way up and they weren't selling that well because they had bad artwork. You know, there were lots of decks produced with bad art, whereas my deck stood out because I'm an artist. It wasn't until like 2000 when I was able to get another deck published. The publishers moved away from doing tarot decks. But then Llewellyn approached me. I was at a a conference, a tarot conference in Chicago, uh, giving a lecture. And then Llewellyn approached me and they wanted, you know, they wanted to know if I could do a tarot on like a Christian theme. And I said, well, yeah, I've been working on this idea about saints cards and how saints cards are related to playing cards and how, like, you could use saint cards like tarot cards. And, like, you know, so I, so I did the tarot of the saints. And then and, – and also I had this revelation about Buddhism in the tarot and how the story of Buddha, of Siddhartha becoming enlightened, was basically the same message. That's the great work of alchemy. That's the trumps in the tarot. That's this universal message and how they could – and then all these Buddhist icons could be seen as – uh, related to the tarot cards. So I started doing the Buddha tarot. So while I was working on the tarot of saints, they actually gave me another contract to do the Buddha tarot. So they did the two of those. I sort of got pigeon. It was weird because I was pigeon because I did the alchemical tarot, the angels tarot and the and tarot of the saints. So then people started saying, oh, that Christian tarot guy. And then I did the Buddha tarot. And they said, oh, maybe he's not a Christian, you know? So then I did the vampire tarot. So now they said, no, I don't know what to make of this. You know? <laughs> So the thing was, see, but they were all driven by my own visions. Like almost all of them started with a vision like, uh, uh, you know, that I had where I had this sort of revelation about how the things went together. So so the, the, with the vampire tour, I was this, it was the story of Dracula. And uh, I was realizing how Drac- the story of Dracula was basically related to the Grail legend, how the Grail legend was one of the things related to, the, you know, was one of the mystical ideas that related to the great work of alchemy and the tarot and how this could all connect together. You know, like th- think about like the Dracula story. Like Dracula is this prince from you know this far off uh, wasteland where he's a, he's basically because of his illness he's created a wasteland around him where and everybody's afraid of him and nothing's growing and he lives in this castle off on a mountain by himself. He wants to come to England and you know uh, suck the blood of uh, young English women and like this whole sexual thing, right? And Basically, because he he's diseased, but he lives on this blood, he lives forever because because uh, being a vampire, he doesn't die. And uh, but the heroes have to come and basically relieve him. Now, if you look at the earliest Grail legends, where Parsifal stumbles on the like, it comes to this wasteland where the where the Grail King lives, and the, and the wasteland is is desolate because the Grail King is sick because he has a sickness, but he can't die because he has this cup of blood that's the blood of Christ that he drinks. And it makes him immortal, but he won't die, but he's sick. And therefore, because the king's sick, the whole land is sick. 
And and Parsifal's supposed to ask the right question to cure the land, right? And of course, he he doesn't know. And and he wakes up in the morning, and everybody's gone from the castle. And then he has and he leaves and loses his way. And it takes him years, and he has to get friends to come back to the castle and and get the and say the right question and let the king die. And then he and he marries the king's daughter, and and the whole thing, the, the kingdom's revived. So, see, the vampire is like the Grail King. <laughs> You know, because he because he, he's sick and he, and he and he can't die because he keeps drinking his blood. But the whole point is the hero has to come and relieve him of this and re, and revive and bring back the health of the kingdom. You see, in the in the story of Dracula, Mina, who's Jonathan Jonathan uh, Harker, that's his fiance, but she gets bitten by Dracula, so she has this connection. And she's turning into a vampire, so he has to kill Dracula, to save her, and then marries her, and then everybody's happy at the end. It's it's basically you know related story. And vampires were really hot right then again, and like nobody was seeing this. So, uh, so I I did this. St. Martin's Press published it, and of course at that time, that's when Twilight came out. So then the interest in vampires started shifting from Dracula to you know sparkly vampires. So it didn't sell that well. <laughs> as I hope for all the energy I put into it, there's still interest in it, and it's being. Uh, I think Schiffer is going to reprint it, and also I have a, a French publishing company that wants to do a French edition right now. We're in the age of Aquarius right now. And what are you most optimistic about in the age of Aquarius? And what do you think people can look forward to? You're guided by your your dreams and your visions. But what does age of Aquarius mean to you? Well, what, when do you think age of Aquarius starts? Sorry. Well, if I looked astrologically, I would say in the last few years, but it almost seems like there was this Renaissance age in the sixties where people were more spiritually evolved and more open. And then we've kind of gone through these transitions. If I look at it astrologically in the last few years and going through the pandemic has been very difficult, but now that we're in, you know, moving towards Aquarius, I feel like things are opening up spiritually. We have artificial intelligence, but it's different. I feel like things are unfolding. And I truly believe that we can shift energy and move them in different directions, depending on, you know, the people around us and the decisions we make. Things change on a daily basis. Yeah. Okay. I did a card reading about it uh, before, you know, like yesterday. In the Tarot of the Sevenfold Mystery, you know, I basically did my standard three card spread. I just wanted to get advice from the higher self about, you know, what, you know, what can I expect from the age of Aquarius? Okay. So the central image is the nine of coins, which shows a money tree. The coins here look like pentacles, like there's a, a five point star on each coin. And there's this tree coming out of the ground and it's got, and it's got nine coins on it. Now, the reason I made this card with the nine coins as a symbol of prosperity is because the next card, the 10 of coins I chose a man with coins above his head, across his chest, and, and covering his eyes, so all he sees is coins. So to me, the nine of coins has a specific meaning in contrast to the ten of coins, because the ten of coins represents materialism. It represents the way a lot of people look at capitalism. is like capitalism is based on winner take all. Like people are supposed to get more and more and more money, and the more money you get, the bigger, you know, the more important you are, the bigger winner you are, and so they're sort of hoarding resources hoarding money and sort of like you're sort of taking you're taking you know resources from the earth and then turning into money and hoarding the money at first that sort of was spurred on a lot of creativity and and made a lot of advancements but it's gotten to the point where now it's actually can hurt the earth you know it's limiting and that's what people you know with climate change and things like that we're seeing the the limits and how this could be really destructive now the now the nine of coins which is the central image in the reading uh, it, it represents it represents what I consider a healthy prosperity. In other words, where you, you it, like a tree's grown, like you you've, you planted coins in the ground, and now the money tree's grown, right? So like your investments are playing off, paying off, but they pay off like the way uh, you know apples grow on a tree. In other words, like you don't just pick all the apples all at once. Like the idea is that every year apples come up, and you keep the tree healthy, and it keeps producing apples. So you want it, so you and you get the apples as you need them. You don't try to get get more and more and more apples so you kill the tree you just want to you want to keep that tree healthy and have it keep producing apples and and then the apples come as you need them and then that's real prosperity having what you need when you need it so that's what i think world is trying to move towards that consciousness and that's what green the green new deal is and all these things and the climate accords that are going on you know okay so now in the three card reading that's the central card now, to the left of it is the two of staffs. Now, the two of staffs in my Tarot of the Sevenfold Mystery, they're, they're actually torches. 
because I'm relating it to fire, where of course the coins are related to earth. And there's what's one arm holding a torch, and and it, and you just see the arm coming out holding a torch, and then you see another arm coming in from the other side holding a torch at an angle and joining it to the first torch. The one that's held upright is it has a symbol of Venus, and the other one has a symbol for Mercury, which is Venus's lover. And the two f- torches are joined together to make one flame. So it's like the two flames become one, which is like you know lo- like two people their love joins together and becomes one love. But the thing is, the Venus one is held upright, and that arm is coming from the uh, the money tree, and then the Mercury one is coming from the outside and joining in with it. So it's not like okay, you know, we could do it either way. It's like, no, the Venus way is the stable way and Mercury's way is to join with it, to harmonize with that. And she's the one connected to the money tree. So in other words, it's like people must be invited into this conscious and join with this consciousness. And on the other side is the eight of swords, which shows eight swords sh- stuck in the ground. And there's this uh, this man who's chained and bound, like in the, the swords are sort of look like bars in a cage and he's like chained in there. And he's all red and like like filled with heat and energy that like is being repressed. Like basically, he's locked up. Okay, so the bill that President Biden was trying to put forward, where you know, it has certain aspects which which address climate change. Like what people were complaining because like the thing is, it had aspects which had what they they call it the carrot and the stick. Or in other words, like there's certain incentives for companies to do things to improve cl- the climate. And then there's certain punishments for not doing it, right? Which is stick. Okay, so the carrot and the stick. And then what happened is as with through the negotiations, they took out the stick and just left the carrots, right? Okay, and so that's a lot of people complaining about this. But what, what this is saying is that we're going forward, we have to have both things. We have to have carrots, which is you know, the, the the two of staffs, like, you know, join up, join with us. It's it's we we'd love to have you and you get benefits from being with us. And the other side is like like the other things have to be repressed. We have to have sticks. We have to have punishments for people who who, who go against us out of greed because it's not going to work. So the new age is an age. It has to be an age where we revive the earth, where we, we we bring real prosperity that's ongoing and not just based on materialism and greed. You see, it's like, like we're in the struggle right now for this to happen, right? If we're being optimistic and this is the age of course, and then it's telling us that we have to go there. So it's like, okay, well, how do we get there in the smoothest way? So far it hasn't, it's been up, you know, one step forward, one step backwards, you know? I think that spiritually we can get there. I think the pandemic has shifted people's perceptions and people have made changes in their life that they might not have had the opportunity to make. So I'm very hopeful. You have to be hopeful because I know this, how's it going to happen if we're not hopeful, right? If everybody just right now is very helpful and visualize that this is going to happen, then all the right actions will happen. It's a, a, the thing is not everybody's on board yet. So that's so the, so that's sort of what the reading's about. It's like people have to get on board. They have to join forces with Venus, who's the goddess of the earth. Well, thank you so much for doing the interview today. I really appreciate your insights and sharing the history of tarot. It's been fascinating. Once again, thank you. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Robert. All right, take care. You just heard the Age of Aquarius podcast with your host, JC Nova. Remember to subscribe to the show on your favorite streaming platform. Thanks for tuning in. Age of Aquarius is a cosmic media production and recorded in Los Angeles, California. A special thanks to our producers, Georgie Rutherford and Christopher Lang. To learn more about Age of Aquarius, please visit our website at ageofaquarius.fm. Thanks for listening. Yeah.